Hi, thanks very much for, for having me. So, I'm going to talk to you today about sex work, a bit of a topic change. Um, I want you to think about what images conjure up in your mind when you hear the phrase sex worker. So I'm going to give you some examples of the common answers that, that I hear from students and beyond when I ask them this question. So, on one hand, we have, maybe, you might disagree or agree, phrases such as criminal, such as drug addict, victim, exploited. Conversely, you might think more diary of a call girl, belle de jour-esque phrases such as glamorous, rich, empowered, hypersexual even. But I want you to think about this gap in the middle of my two hands. Quite often, and I'm sure perhaps this maybe has happened to you, it certainly was something that I experienced when embarking on this research topic, stereotypes and assumptions affect perceptions of aspects of our life, such as sex work, that perhaps we don't have direct experience in personally, but we make assumptions based on perhaps media stereotypes, based on stories that you hear and so on. But this middle ground in the centre is often overlooked. We often think in these binary categories, these quite black and white categories. So when I asked you that question initially, did you ever think of a phrase such as community, neighbour, friend, relative, when you think of the phrase sex worker? So those stereotypes and assumptions create moral panics and they create myths about the industry. And I'm going to cover three of these myths today and I'm going to focus a little bit more on the last one. Okay. So, one common myth, one common perception, and this again is largely based on how the industry is constructed in the media, either via docudramas or indeed um, fiction and so on, that sex work predominantly happens on the street. That's quite often the common kind of imagery that's constructed uh, in mind. So street corners, for example, stilettos and fishnet stockings uh, as an example. And actually, on the street part of, the, of sex work, part of the industry, is the minority of the industry. So although figures vary depending on sample size and geographical location, typically we're talking single figure percentage, so between around 3 and 10% uh, of, of sex work happens on the street. And another common assumption about this part of the industry, this particular space in which sex work happens, is that those that opt to use this particular space will never choose to do so. That's not, that's not a space that is ideal, it's not a space that would be kind of the number one choice. But there are, and while that might be true for, for some sex workers, there are some sex workers that do choose this particular space. They see it as perhaps a less structured form of the industry and that suits their, their lifestyle, they want that flexibility, they don't want to have to pay a fee, for example, to a brothel madam or, or for whatever reason. So, there is an element of choice there for some sex workers. So that's myth one. Myth two, sex work always involves human trafficking. And quite often, in policy and pol political discussions about the industry, about sex work, these two expressions, these two phrases are conflated. So they're seen as one and the same, that it always, sex work always involves human trafficking. Now, sex work refers to the consensual exchange of sexual labour for either money or goods. Human trafficking refers to coercion, refers to forced labour, whether or not that involves sex, but the focus is, is the exploitation and the coercion. So they are not the same thing. And it's dangerous to conflate the two for a variety of reasons, but I said to you before about that choice element, that for those sex workers that do choose the industry, perpetually constructing them as a victim erases that choice and erases that agency for those that are choosing to do so. And there are a whole host of other reasons, which is another TED talk, as to why it's dangerous to conflate these two terms. But one other example is that trafficking figures are very difficult to estimate, and I'm sure you understand why that is. It's obviously a very clandestine thing to happen, and indeed it's very, very difficult to estimate numbers as a result of that. And if you do a quick Google, you'll see that those numbers vary depending on who creates the figures and so on. So it's very important, another side message, to be critical of those figures and to look at the source and to look at the sample size, etc. Okay, myth three, the one that I'm going to focus on uh, in more detail shortly. <coughs> Sex work is only ever a nuisance, either in on or off street forms, in residential communities. And it's constructed as a nuisance for a variety of reasons. Some examples include 
it attracts crime, attracts criminal activity, and the side effect of that is that I'm therefore fearful. I'm fearful of crime happening to me in my community because of potentially dodgy clients and all the associated secondary effects that that might bring. And se such secondary effects include, for example, that it might affect the reputation of my town, of my city. It might reduce house prices, for example. It might make people think about where I live differently, and they might not want to hang around uh, where I live, for example. And there are other, there are other things that, that are associated with that in the nuisance framework. So it, it attracts lots of traffic, it's very noisy, but largely these fall under a moralistic viewpoint about the industry, rather than tangible evidence. So it's often a fear rather than a reality in terms of actual tangible effects on residential communities. Now, if you'd have asked me in an audience such as yourself a few years ago before I embarked on this research, I would have put my hand up and said, yes, I believe all of these myths. This is definitely something that, that I associate with the industry. And I found that my research really took me on a journey, actually. It really made me question my own prejudice. It questioned my own critical nature or lack of with regards to such evidence being presented. I also learned an awful lot about the relationship between sex workers and residential communities. The story was far more complex than I envisaged. So I'm going to talk to you about my PhD research, which was focusing on a case study in Blackpool. If anybody's ever been to Blackpool, it's not very far away from Lancaster, it's a bit further south on the coast. It's a coastal resort, and it has a collection of brothels. And they're quite clustered together. Uh, in Blackpool. There are, there are two quite prominent areas in Blackpool where, where brothels are clustered. Just to give you a quick insight into the legal context, so it's not illegal um, in England to be a sex worker under certain conditions, but the law does make it very difficult. So to solicit on street is an offence, to manage and operate in a brothel is an offence, um, and indeed to involve any coercion, um, such as human trafficking, is also um, an offence. And there are other, other ones that I won't go into. But brothels vary in terms of how local authorities implement that law. So quite often local authorities will turn a blind eye to brothels being in the, in the urban landscape as long as they, they behave in certain ways. And there's a very much variance, there's a degree of variance according to the local authorities approach. So if you move between different areas of the UK then you'll find that there are varying degrees of tolerance. Now Blackpool has a regulated tolerance approach. Some of these brothels have been there for, for 20 years, for example, at this morning. In case you've never come across a brothel before, or in case you haven't ever seen images of, of them, here are some examples behind me as to what the brothels look like uh, in Blackpool. These are just a few of them. There's quite a few, actually. So on the left-hand side, you'll see a doorway. So some brothels will have an open door. So as you're walking past as a lay person, you'll notice the door open. But it won't necessarily be directly obvious that it's a brothel unless you look quite carefully through the corridor and you see an image such as that on the doorway. And even then, you might not necessarily immediately think that's a brothel. Now, this one on the left-hand side has a business name, has a business aesthetic, quite a confident business aesthetic. It has a website. Sometimes we'll have a sign in the window saying vacancies, for example, if they're looking for new staff. But you'll also notice, if you look carefully, that there's an intercom on the interior door. Now, one of my prejudices was, can't ever be safe either for the sex workers. But actually what that intercom suggests, and something that sex workers confirmed to me, because I did go in and speak to some sex workers in the brothels, that there was a degree of vetting that occurred with clients. So if they see that maybe they're, they're drugged up, or they're, they're drunk, or too drunk, then they perhaps won't let them in. So there's a degree of safety and security there in terms of the business aesthetic and how they, how they appear in the streetscape. As I say, that has a prominent business name, as does the one on the bottom right hand side. That's called Twilight Babes, okay? And it has, as you, see, as you can see, some imagery on the outside. But there are also some that are a little less obvious. So the top right hand one is, is an example. So it hasn't got any kind of sexual imagery on the outside. It's just got a little flower. And indeed, it doesn't have a business name as such. It just has a street name there and a number. So what I did was, I spent some time talking to sex workers spent some time talking to residents in and around these, these brothels. They're actually called massage parlours in Blackpool. It's quite common to, for, that, for that label to happen. And they are very much well interspersed with other non-sex work related businesses. So there are, there's a jewellers down there, for example, a couple of estate agents, Chinese community centre, as well as flats and houses uh, in and around these two areas. 
So they're not in a typical kind of red light district bounded area where that's the only type of business or premise that, that's around. They're well interspersed with other things. So what did I learn? What did I learn about brothels in the community, in this community especially? And I learned that brothels did not just fit this nuisance narrative that dominated the literature, dominated research about the industry. They had a variety of roles in the everyday lives of residences and other non-sex work businesses around. And I'm going to talk to you quickly about three. Okay, the first one. <laughs> I'll let you two, 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 chuckle at that. This is actually the title, part of the title of my thesis. Um, some residents said, oh, it's really bloody entertaining living here. I enjoy the fact that it's different every day. I enjoy the fact that I can tell stories about living here, that it's sometimes the first question that new customers will ask or new friends will ask that haven't visited me at home or at work before. It's an element of, of community building, which is another theme that I'll talk to, and talk to you about in a moment. It's better than daytime television. This was a chap that was unemployed, that had got a bit bored of sitting in um, all day and quite enjoyed, he said, playing Guess the Punter. <laughs> So there would be you know, lots of different people milling around and they would just watch and see kind of what was going on. And other, other workers in the area said that it brightened up their day. It's a bit dull around here. It's not a particularly busy area of Blackpool, this, this area. And so it can get quite quiet during the day. And so it kept people interested and entertained and it was quite exciting for them to live there. And when I was interviewing residents, they would sometimes beef out their chest and kind of say, somebody's got to live here, it may as well be me, at least I can tell the story. So that was one role. Secondly, and this really goes against the narrative that they only ever attract crime and they make you feel unsafe. Some residents actually reported, again, partly probably because it was a quite a quiet area, that they were, they were a vibrant presence in an otherwise dull place to live or dull place to work. The 24-hour light burning, because quite a few of them are open 24 hours, and they are fairly vibrantly lit, although there is a degree of variance, as I said, in that. These lights burning make me feel more comfortable, they make me feel safer. I feel like if there was, I was ever in trouble, I could actually knock on a door and know that there were sex workers in there to, to maybe help me. And especially with all the stag and hendus around, which if you know Blackpool at all, you know that it's very much associated with stag and hendus. Another quote that I really liked was that somebody said, oh, it makes me feel like somebody's here, even in a place where even the pigeons don't frequent. <laughs> Again, Blackpool, very much known for pigeons and seabirds, and I thought that was quite, quite revealing, actually, about the role that they placed on those, those set premises in there. And that community safety role as well, also related to building camaraderie with customers. So they would come in, new customers would come in and talk to me about the industry being here, and it was almost like an opener. I felt like it was, it was something that kind of brought us together. It's a topic of conversation for us when we're hanging out. And finally, <laughs> finally, I'll bring you back to that, that binary that I started with at the beginning and the fact that that middle story is never really captured. They're also just ordinary neighbours. They put the bins out like everybody else. We have normal conversations. I know them all by name. They're my friends. And yes, while there was an element of, they're also quite entertaining and I quite like laughing at them and I quite, not, not sex workers, but I quite like playing games such as Guess the Punter and they make my, my work life more interesting. They're also just ordinary neighbours, an ordinary, an ordinary presence, an ordinary role, which again perhaps disrupts this idea of this nuisance framework always being dominant and always being prevalent. <coughs> that, okay, they might annoy me sometimes, they might make me laugh sometimes, like other businesses, like other residents, like other neighbours, but they're also friends, they're also people that I'm concerned about, they're also people that, that I engage with on a daily basis. And that's really the message that, that I want to leave you with, that sex workers, our friends, their relatives, you might know some, there might be some in this room, they, have, they should have the same rights and respect that anybody else in the community should do. And in terms of consulting them about things that affect their life, such as policy, such as where they should operate, as conversations happen with other sorts of businesses about where they should open and where they shouldn't, they should be involved in that conversation. They should be given that agency and that right as well. And I hope the invisible change that I've left you with today is if you were in the camp like I was, I definitely went on a journey from you know, not having any evidence for my assumptions and my moralising to, hang on a minute, this story is very different to what I thought at the beginning. I hope the invisible change that I've left you with is that we do consider this middle story. Thank you.